So uh, the panel of Christianity and climate talking to our neighbors. Uh, we know there's a strong basis in the world's religions uh, for dealing with climate change. Christianity is no exception. And in fact, there are some really uh, great uh, faith leaders in the uh, Christian world who have taken up the cause. And our panelists are gonna discuss first how their own faith has helped them form and inform their advocacy work on climate change. But then they're gonna talk about finding common ground in speaking with fellow Christians about caring for creation. And our first speaker is David Clowney. He's Professor Emeritus of the Department of Philosophy and World Religions at Rowan University. Uh, my whole bio and his whole bio you'll find on a page for the conference. Um, I'm, by the way, the state coordinator for Tennessee for CCL. I'm also um, the uh, a climate ambassador uh, nationwide for Physicians for Social Responsibility and the national campaign director for the Climate Emergency Coalition. But connected to this uh, particular panel, I'm a member of the Lay Cistercians of Gethsemane Abbey, which is the uh, home, uh, spiritual home of Thomas Merton. Yeah. And I do work with the National Catholic Reporter and Global Catholic Climate Movement and messaging for Pope Francis. So David, um, David Rowan University, Professor Emeritus, retired a couple of years ago, but still, still exceedingly active in uh, adding to the conversation. He was raised in an evangelical household with a Presbyterian pastor, but he has uh, been continually evolving and uh, he uh, got a PhD in philosophy later uh, at Temple University after some time in seminary. Um, and he, uh, I would say, has been a model of being constantly open to the spirit in where it's led him in his faith journey. Um, I'm particularly uh, impressed with the community he belongs to, which is an Episcopal church in Northeast Philadelphia that is very diverse. Uh, he's at times served on the vestry there. And uh, he ended up, uh, by the way, later in life, taking another PhD or taking his new PhD to Rowan University where he's taught there for 30 years and helped start the environmental studies program. So David, ball's in your court. Uh, excuse me, just a moment there. Uh, let's see. There we go. Thank you, Cliff, and uh, welcome everybody to this panel. Uh, evangelical faith motivates many of you, I'm sure, and you certainly have evangelical neighbors coming from this, this, this uh, area of the country. How do you talk with them about climate and environment? Uh, it seems like it should be a no-brainer. Uh, love for the world God made. Uh, it's God's temple. Psalm 19 starts out with how, you know, uh, the heavens declare God's glory, and the first half of it talks about how nature reveals God, and the second about how the Bible reveals God. Uh, loving your neighbor who's homeless, jobless, sick, big biblical kind of theme. Simplicity, humility, faith that God won't let your work go to waste, uh, a big emphasis on not being greedy, but uh, being content. Um, and we've got a kind of constellation of uh, climate stars who are also uh, Christian. Catherine Hayhoe, that wonderful talk she just gave. Francis Collins, the head of the NIH and the Human Genome Project. Sir John Houghton, the uh, chief uh, editor and author of the first three IPCC reports, Cal DeWitt, many others. Uh, and yet, you wouldn't know it from listening to many evangelicals these days. For them, environmentalists are a threat. Climate change is a hoax. They call out Catherine Hayhoe when she goes to talk on uh, Pat Robertson's program about climate. What's going on? I'm going to play a clip from uh, former Senator Rick Santorum when he was running for president about nine years ago. But you'll still hear these same things today. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about your quality of life. It's not about your jobs. It's about some phony ideal, some phony theology. 
Oh, not a theology based on the Bible, different theology. But not a <laughs> so, Sander, I got to ask you, what, what in the world were you talking about, sir? Well, I was talking about the, uh, the radical environmentalists. That's why I was talking about energy. This, uh, this idea that, uh, that man is, uh, is, not, is here to serve the earth as opposed to husband its resources and be good stewards of the earth. Uh, and I think that is a, a, is a phony ideal. I don't believe that that's what, uh, that's what we're here to do, that, uh, we're, that, that man uh, is here to, to use the resources and use them wisely, to care for the earth, to be a steward of the earth. But we're not here to serve the earth. The earth is not the objective. Man is the objective. And, and I think a lot, of radical, uh, a lot of radical environmentalists have it upside down. I, I just said that uh, when you have a, a, a worldview that, that uh, elevates the earth above man and, and, uh, and says that you know, we can't uh, take those resources because we're going to harm the earth uh, by, uh, by things that, are, that, that frankly are just not scientifically proven, like, for example, the politicization of the whole global warming debate. I mean, this is just all, a, all, all an attempt to, um, you know, to centralize power and to give more power to the government. And, and so uh, that's nine years ago, but you still have a lot of the same uh, ideas going on. Uh, this is a, a 14 DVD uh, set uh, from the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation called Resisting the Green Dragon. My brother-in-law has the last two uh, DVDs on it that says that the uh, and environmentalism is one of the greatest threats to society and the church, calls it a new religion, says its policies hurt the poor and threaten the sanctity of life. Why? Well, because environmentalism sees all beings as equal, uh, whereas the Judeo-Christian worldview sees a hierarchy, God and us in God's image. We've got dominion over the rest of creation. God says, be fruitful and, and multiply. Environmentalists want us to stop having babies. God says, uh, we, should, we have dominion over the creation. Uh, environmentalists say, uh, want to restrict those rights in order to protect, you know, uh, spotted owls and funny little fish uh, at the expense of human jobs. They say good stewardship doesn't mean worrying about climate change, biodiversity loss, or overpopulation. Those are pseudo problems and speculations of post-normal science. We can talk about what they mean about that, by that in the discussion period. I won't now, uh, but um, I have ideas. Well, th you know, are they right in a way? Because it's true. Environmentalists often do have problems with patriarchal religion, complain about hierarchy, promote equal value of human and other forms of life. And in fact, uh, here's a paper by an Episcopalian, the medieval historian uh, Lynn White, was a Christian, I guess still is by Christian values, uh, but uh, somewhere else now, the historical roots of our ecological crisis, who says basically Western Christianity is our problem because it's hierarchical and patriarchal. It came into Europe uh, where there were spirits of trees and springs and even mountains. Uh, and got rid of them all. Uh, nature is now a soulless resource. Uh, that gave us modern science and technology, and those cousins got together and had a baby, and it was the Industrial Revolution when it grew up, and that's our problem. We have a religious problem. Uh, being a Christian himself, Lynn White wanted to go back to St. Francis, where nature is full of God's presence, and creatures are our brothers and sisters. And he would say uh, about the Resisting the Green Dragon uh, DVDs, what did you expect them to say? They're just being good Western Christians. Well, I'm not here to attack those ideas, though I mostly don't share them, but rather to ask, how can we as CCL folks communicate with neighbors who believe these things? Um, well, the CCL way tells us, first of all, to listen. Uh, and listen empathetically, because people are going to care about these things. And then try to find common ground. If you're a Christian, can you do that? Sure. And I'm going to suggest a few ways. Even if you're not one, can you do it? Yeah. The famous biologist E.O. Wilson was raised as a Southern Baptist. He now identifies 
uh, as a secular humanist uh, atheist. But um, he wrote a book called The Creation to his former co-religionists saying, you folks of all people, if you believe the Bible, should be motivated to care for God's creation. So you don't argue about politics and don't argue about stewardship because even if you have some issues with that, uh, there's, it's arguably in the Bible, but you could uh, have a different attitude toward it. I'm gonna step over into Jewish territory for a minute uh, and quote from uh, a paper by uh, the ecologist David Ehrenfeld and his rabbi Bill, Pen Bill excuse me, Philip Bentley, uh, talking about stewardship being corrupted to the belief that we're lords and not caretakers, instead of having the ideas of restraint, non-interference, and humility that actually come with it in the Bible. And this lovely rabbinical quote, man was created on the eve of the Sabbath, and for what reason? So that, in case his heart grew proud, one might say to him, even the gnat was in creation before you were there. You can share experience. Uh, Share the presence of God in nature. What do they love about it? What, what do you love? Uh, I'm a bird watcher. Here are two of my favorites, a pileated woodpecker and the osprey. Uh, I, I just imagine myself floating in a, uh, in a lake, looking up in the osprey overhead. Wonderful. Uh, you can find, you know, these folks may very well have a deep experience of God when they're out in nature, and you can share that. Then you can ask, do you see the world changing? As a bird watcher, I see different birds than I used to. And it's not because I'm going out bird watching more often. It's because the migratory uh, patterns have changed because uh, the climate is changing and different birds are here. And then you could share how love for God's creation motivates you to work with Citizens Climate Lobby. You can share resources. These slides will be uh, kept and I'm not going to uh, mention them all right now. Uh, you can share activities. You can clean up the neighborhood. You can, garden. You can play music together. Here's me uh, playing music with one of my former students. Fantastic way to bond with people and you get into all kinds of conversations. Uh, you can uh, carry food and supplies and relief to people who are in difficulty. And just being neighborly in whatever way you can, talking while you work and resting together, you make connections that open up possibilities uh, to share. You can talk about God's two books. And they probably believe that, that nature reveals God and so, uh, so does scripture. Uh, and you can talk about how they reinforce each other. And then maybe a few little questions might come up about how they tug in opposite directions and how you handle that. And if you can get to that without challenging them, uh, you may be able to build on what they say about their experience of seeing, well, it looks like they contradict, but they can't. So how do I work that out? Um, and you might share experiences of your own that way. Uh, having a kind of humility that is not greedy. Uh, does, how can, you know, you might, we could be opposite to the culture, which is all about more, 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 more. Uh, and, uh, a, you know, caring about climate change means we have to use less, 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 and yet uh, still have an abundant life and it's possible. Uh, so you can talk about uh, depending on prayer and science uh, and about uh, if people think they can't accomplish anything, just use uh, what you learned today from Catherine Hayhoe about all the ways that you individually make a difference and then can make a difference in changing the systems, which has to happen, of course. Uh, there are many Christians around the world deeply involved in, environmental in the environmental movement, motivated by the stewardship idea, by the idea that nature reveals God, and by concern for future human generations, uh, including strong evangelical environmental movements that you can refer people to. Uh, I can say more later, but I want to uh, pass the baton to our next presenter. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. David Clowney. Um, that was great. I'd like to next introduce Dr. William Stigliani. Uh, Bill has his PhD in chemistry from Princeton's, worked as an environmental scientist in the 70s. You can read his bio uh, on the bio page. Uh, 
uh, but I would note that he served on the Environmental Studies Board of the National Academy of Sciences. He's been a professor of environmental science and sustainability at the University of Northern Iowa, uh, helped start the Center for Energy and Environmental Education, and he's a parishioner at Old St. Joe's in downtown Philly, a Roman Catholic church that is worth uh, visiting, by the way, if you're passing through Philly as a historic site. So, Bill, take it. Okay, testing my technical prowess here. Um, share screen. Okay, thank you and um, welcome all uh, to this session. My name is Bill Stiliani. Yeah, I am a Catholic. My home parish is Old St. Joseph's Church in Philadelphia, Jesuit Church, and um, St. Francis of Assisi has been my hero. He has inspired me, uh, my career as an environmental scientist and he has inspired me in my spiritual life as well. St. Francis is a patron saint of ecology and who many Catholics revere as the saint who most exemplifies the living gospel of Christ. The Pope took his name after St. Francis of Assisi because in his words, he was the man of poverty, the man of peace, the man who loves and protects creation. David focused on how to make connections with your evangelical neighbors. I'm going to focus on why we should care for the creation and our underlying relationship to the natural world from the Franciscan perspective. So the Pope uh, wrote his encyclical Laudato Si on care of our common home in 2015. The words Laudato Si are taken from St. Francis's poem, <clears throat> The Canticle of the Creatures, also perhaps more popularly known as The Canticle of the Sun. It was written in um, almost 800 years ago in 1225. He wrote it in the dialect spoken in his home province of Umbria. I believe it was the first uh, piece of literature written in the vernacular Italian rather than in Latin. And because of that, it was clearly understandable to the common people with whom Francis was so affiliated. So these are some of the quotes from the, the Pope's encyclical. Uh, they indicate the Pope's profound concern about climate change and the urgent need for action. He specifically names climate change as the major threat to what he calls our common home. What the Pope means by our common home is our ecological home. The word ecology, in fact, comes from the Greek word oikos, meaning household. So the Pope's expands the common our, uh, expands our common home beyond the traditional notion of home to include the other creatures that share the planet with us and that we view all life as part of our ecological family. If you look at the descriptors in St. Francis' Canticle, he talks about our connection to the natural world as if we were all family members, brother, son, sister, moon, mother, earth, and so on. And uh, it kind of blows me away that he wrote this poem nearly 800 years ago, and that he had this prophetic vision of life as connected rather than atomized into separate entities, uh, a, a notion that we are becoming more and more uh, conscious of, especially in recent decades. So um, one reason why we have to care for the creation is our affection for it. From the Franciscan perspective, all of creation gives praise to God. We cannot love God without loving the creation that praises him. The idea of falling in love with the creation, having affection for it, came to me at a very young age. 
I lived adjacent to a wet, it was actually an abandoned farmland that had turned into a wetland that was teeming with frogs, snakes, turtles, and muskrats. I spent many a summer day poling through the swamp with my friend Ricky on a raft we had made, uh, playing with the animals, especially with the frogs. I had this, uh, uh, affection builds on familiarity and the frogs became my compadres. They were friends, neighborhood friends. So much so that um, in my freshman year, I had to excuse myself from all the zoology labs where, where frogs were being um, uh, dissected, uh, pithed in the back of their head, killed and dissected. I just couldn't do it. It was as if I were putting a needle right into my own thumb rather than with the frog. So I think that also um, uh, speaks to the, the need that we have to, to, um, to keep our connections with the natural world, to stay in nature, to be out in nature, to um, the familiarity that, that, that comes with the affection. So um, some may view my perspective and perhaps St. Francis's perspective as a kind of nature wor worship where um, somehow discount humans and exalt the creatures up to, uh, to an equal plane or even perhaps higher as Rick Santorum was talking about. Um, but I feel this is a poorly posed assertion. Our love of ourselves and certainly of our God is intrinsically tied to our love of creation. And I will say further that the natural world is closer to us than we are to ourselves. And we are mostly oblivious to the intimate connection we have to nature. The second reason why we should care about the creation is what I call gratitude for service. We are in service of each other and highly interdependent and live within the circle of life. And isn't it wonderful that God constructed the creation that way? It is so intrinsically humbling. From a kind of systems theory point of view, our interconnections allow us to be greater than the sum of our parts. That is to say one plus one equals three, um, which doesn't make sense in strict mathematics, but that's what happens in the system. All the parts contribute and because of their interactions, they create a whole that is greater than the sum of the parts. What I find so fundamental about all of this is that it brings to the forefront the dimension of immense gratitude to our sense of stewardship. We need the natural world at least as much as the natural world needs us. We are stewards of the natural world, that's for sure, but the natural world takes very good care of us and are stewards to us as well. The human body is an example of a nested ecological home. Imagine that we share our human body with 10,000 other species, microbial species. 90% of our cell, the cells in our body are non-human cells. We are absolutely dependent on this non-human part of, a part inside of us for our health and very existence. They not only contribute to digesting our food, they provide energy for our brain, they protect our health. We couldn't live for two seconds without the microbes in our body body that we share our body with. We are not in charge. We don't order the microbes around and tell them what to do. We provide a safe haven for them and in symbiosis they provide vital services for us. All the parts of the system work for the common good in the common ecological home called our bodies. On the macro scale of the biosphere, the creatures of the world provide vital services for all of human society. Environmentalists call these ecosystem services. Just imagine bees pollinate our plants. A half a million worms living in an acre of soil make 50 tons of fertilizer rich castings per year. The rainforests supply healing medicines and balance our oxygen supply. Coral reefs protect our coastlines from storms and erosion and are a protective habitat for numerous marine species. Um, uh, just recently, or a few years ago, there was a study done, an update actually, in which the services provided by the uh, biosphere free of charge were monetized. In other words, how much would it cost if humans were to conduct these services? And they came up with an estimate of $125 trillion a year 
which the biosphere adds to our economy free of charge, that is, on, that is larger than the global monetized economy. Um, and what I wanna say here is that we are not the CEOs. We do not run the world. The natural world takes care of us, not because we commanded to do so, but because they were created to do so by God. And finally, um, in the humility of the Franciscan spirit, I think instead of a posture of dominance or paternalism toward other life on the planet, we should be effusive in our reverence and thankfulness for how well we have been taken care of and for all that has been given to us. The end. Right on time. That was really beautiful. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn now to uh, Dr. Kristen Poole. Kristen has her doctorate in English and American Literature and Language from Harvard. She also recently completed a master's in sacred theology at Philadelphia's United Lutheran Seminary. Uh, she has some wide ranging interests and uh, we'll talk about more of them and uh, her work in the Q and A, but why don't we uh, turn immediately to Kristen's thoughts. Kristen, take it, please. Thank you, Cliff. It looks like Bill is working on taking down, on, on sharing his screen so I can share mine. I'm sorry, what do I have to do for that? I'm very sorry. Um, let's see, stop share. Yes, there you go. Got it, sorry about that, sorry. Great. Um, now, well, thank you everyone for joining this panel and we're great to have people to talk to about this topic. So I will pull up my own um, show here, slideshow, play from start. Sometimes takes a second. And if, you, if anyone can't see that, please let me know. So I'm going to talk about um, climate change in the context of Christian ethics and hopefully just provide a little bit of a framework for how do we even talk about climate change in this context. This work is coming out or this, this talk is coming out of a book I wrote um, just published last April, um, Christianity in a Time of Climate Change. And I've got CCL all over this book. It was completely um, inspired by CCL and various CCL members. Um, so that's where these ideas are coming from. So I wanted to start off because I'm a teacher with a pop quiz. And the question is, what percentage of the American population considers climate change to be a religious issue? I want to just take a quick second and think about what percentage of people associate climate change with religion. And the answer is 9%. I found this totally shocking um, when I went to the Yale, you know, the Yale Climate Communication Study, which again, I know through CCL, um, only 9% of the country considers climate change to be a religious concern as opposed to a political or an environmental um, issue. And that, in, in a large way, this statistic is what prompted me to write my book. So just to really sort of walk through the dots here, if we're going to accept that human action through the burning of fossil fuels is causing climate change, or at least hugely co contributing to climate change, and if we accept that climate change does harm to other human beings, and that harming other human beings violates biblical dictates of care. Thus, you can say climate change absolutely falls within the realm of religious concerns. Um, Bill's talk just focused a little bit more on the natural world, and my talk is gonna focus more on human impact. So where do we find, you know, sort of a, a working vocabulary to start thinking about or talking about climate change um, you saw Catherine Hayo's talk a little bit ago, you know, just launching the conversations. Where do we find um, fodder for launching those conversations? If we look to the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, um, one of the phrases that runs through that scripture, like a refrain, is very variations on throughout generations. 
I just pulled, you know, some examples here from Exodus, and then you move into Leviticus, you move into Numbers, throughout generations, throughout generations. This is really a recurring um, emphasis of the, um, of the Hebrew scripture. Um, and so at one end of the spectrum, we can, of the harm, the spectrum of harm is what I'm calling it, we are leaving a diminished world for our children. Um, that actually is my child. Uh, she's a little bit older right now. She's actually speaking at this very moment over on the, um, the other panel about youth engagement. Um, but, you know, I'm obviously hugely motivated by what we're leaving to our own children. This is maybe the most depressing graph I've seen this year. Um, this is chronicling the, um, the Western monarch population. I have a chapter on monarchs, or I address them in one of the chapters of my book, written in 2019. And, you know, at that point, there had been this precipitous drop in the monarch population, and there were fears of extinction. And unfortunately, it looks like that is now coming to pass. There's been a 99.9% .9 drop in the Western monarch population since the um, 1980s and we're probably beyond the point of recovery. So, you know, my child, it affects my child in just leaving this diminished world. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum of harm, we have huge natural disasters that we know of. So I'm sure that this woman loves her child every much as I love mine and we're causing profound suffering of other people. If we look to the New Testament, we find this ethos of care for the neighbor. Um, I'm guessing most of the people who came onto this call are coming from a Christian perspective. So, um, and if not, this love your neighbor as yourself in some ways is kind of the core of the New Testament. New Testament in a way, love God, love neighbor, you know, that's, that's it. So we have this strong ethos of care for the neighbor. And I don't want to say that Hebrew scripture doesn't have that because um, that's part of Hebrew scripture as well. We can think of this in terms of environmental justice, that the whole infrastructure of fossil fuels we know is calling, causing immediate disproportionate harm um, to poorer communities. We could also think of issues of food insecurity. Um, this is something, apple blossoms is something I grew up with. I know very well. My family um, is in Western Michigan. My father has an apple farm, apple orchard. And increasingly, because of the weird weather, um, it's really hard to grow a crop of apples anymore. You know, they freeze, they get flooded. It's just, it's become so inconsistent. He's a small time apple farmer. It's maybe not the end of the world, but once we scale that up, we are, you know, there's a the, um, big question about food insecurity. So if we're going to accept that this is a problem, how are we thinking about it in Christian terms? And I want to talk about how we use the S word. Uh, I forgot to say that I'm Episcopalian and Episcopalians don't really like the S word, but there it is. We're going to think about sin. And Part of what motivates, uh, motivated me to start thinking about sin was I, um, at one of the sparks for my book, our bishop, Daniel Gutierrez, was doing his rotations and he came to our, our church and at coffee hour, I stood up and I said, so what is the diocese doing about climate change? And first he said, I don't know, what are you doing about climate change? Kind of threw the question back, which took me a little bit by surprise. And then he went on to say he didn't think that people really had a working vocabulary for how do we even just start talking about it. So I'm trying to think of ways we can put it in a familiar pre-existing Christian context. Um, if we're going to think about um, sin, sin is about discerning culp guilt or culpability. But how on earth do you do that in the context of climate change? If you have, in the realm of traditional ethics, I'm gonna to have to sort of speed through some of these slides, um, but you know, traditional ethics, this quote from Hans Jonas here, it's of the here and now, occasions as they rise between men, between people, recurrent typical situations of private and public life, right? So if you have an immediate situation, your neighbor is throwing stuff on your, on your property, you can handle that in, a, you know, it's a very immediate, 
um, understanding. But when we talk about climate change, it doesn't really fit into our traditional ways of understanding guilt or innocence and responsibility, right? And here's our basic model. The sunlight comes in, but it can't go out um, because of our greenhouse gases that are building up in the atmosphere. First problem we have is the problem of time. So, you know, if you think about how long these carbon dioxide molecules are, are staying in the atmosphere, maybe they're from Tuesday, maybe from they're from 1868, maybe they're from 1972 or 26. It's that complicates questions of, of guilt and culp culpability. The other problem we have is space. Um, if I drive my car and emit emissions here in uh, Philadelphia, doesn't mean they hang right over my house or over my car. We all know this, right? So you have this um, intermingled um, planet-wide um, accretion of greenhouse gases. So if you want to just take a moment, maybe look out your window and see if you can identify the CO2, CO2 molecules um, up there, you know, which ones are yours? What are you responsible for? Um, it's obvious, this is obviously a trick question because we can't do that. And if we can't do that, from an ethical standpoint, whose fault is it? How do, we, how do we start to talk about culpability and climate change within a context of ethics? Um, this is one candidate, not me. I don't know if anyone knows not me. I have kids, so not me is living in my house a lot. Maybe we blame the people at the time of the Industrial Revolution or the people who made the car or uh, the oil industry, oil and gas industry. This is a refinery in Philadelphia. I used to drive by every day on my way to work. Um, it actually blew up uh, about a year ago. Um, and, you know, then I have to think though, but wait, you know, it was because of that, that my family was able to make that great trip to the national parks in the 70s. It's because I enjoyed the benefits of travel. When I'm cooking food for my family, it, you know, how is that, is that guilt? If I'm sitting here in my warm home having coffee, where do I locate culpability there? What if I'm driving to church? This is my church, St. Paul's out in Chestnut Hill, Philadelphia. So because of this temporal and spatial complexity, we have a new problem when it comes to climate change. Um, I am going to have to speed through that one. But basically, you know, the old model, you had a sort of day-to-day -day sphere of direct human in interaction. Now this problem has become so interconnected, it's hard to link the doer. So the first problem, we're gonna name it in theological terms. I find it really helpful to think in terms of sin with a capital S and sin with a lowercase. There's some ways in which we've just been born into a carbon intensive world it's where we are. You can almost think of it as original sin. And in that way, it's collective. And then there are other things that you might do or not do that are your own personal actions. And just making that distinction, I find to be very helpful. What are some of the resources that Christiani Christianity offers for contemplating this problem? I think the Trinity is really useful as a way of imagining individual and collective as being intertwined. So it's not entirely somebody else's problem and it's not entirely your responsibility. There's, there's a balance between the collective and the individual. There are the interconnections. Um, this is the thesis of Pope Francis's Legato Si, thinking about how we're all interconnected, some of what Bill was talking about. The emphasis on personal change, that's really at the heart of the Pauline Epistles, people change. Um, collective support through worship, right? There's the, the, the body, there's the, the collect collectivity of Christianity. Um, we're not doing this all alone. Personal contemplation and hope. Um, hope is absolutely woven into the fabric of Christian theology, uh, if you wanna think about the eschaton. And finally, I just wanted to say thank you um, for all that you are doing as CCL members. 
Kristen, and thank you. That was great. And again, thank all of you, uh, David, Bill, Kristen, for your comments. Um, let's go for a moment to the chat. Uh, please, again, find that uh, person to address, ask me a question. And uh, sh uh, let me ask her, is there any question in the chat? There that no, There are no questions in the chat. There are okay. your reminders about the uh, session this evening and the sessions tomorrow and the links to them if he wants those. Okay. But nobody has put a question in chat that I can see. All right, so if you have a question, uh, please type it into the chat to ask me in chat. And in the meantime, I'd like to ask a question. I've, I've got a few here, but let me turn to uh, kind of a softball question. Kristen, since you were the last one speaking, uh, your 2020 book, Christianity in a Time of Change. Um, let me see if I can get myself back into space. Um, a Time of Climate Change to Give a Future with Hope. And that's been described as exploring the ethics of futurity. So I want to ask you, what exactly is meant by futurity? And then I want you to discuss that subtitle, to give future a future with hope, and ask you to address the question, do you still have hope, how much and why? Um, thank you, Cliff. That's a great question. Uh, futurity is a kind of fancy pants word for just describing everything pertaining to the future. Um, I stopped using that word as much because I thought I can just say the future. So that was sort of a, a revelation to me. Like, um, you know, academics like to think of hard words when the easy words are just as good and not better. So that's all that means. Um, yeah, you know, I, the question of hope, and this is part of the reason I, I keep coming back to CCL in, um, for that sustenance and for that for that hope. Sometimes when people, you know, you're talking to people and they're spiritual but not religious, or they don't believe in organized religion. And of course, there's the old joke that you know, if you think religion is organized, <laughs> you you probably don't belong to a church. But um, nothing personal get. But you know, we're all a bunch of lay volunteers trying to get you know things going. And I think of. Um, you know, I, I'm a pretty spiritually lazy person without a community, and I start to fall away. And I think of the community of CCL as I also fall into despair. And then I come back to CCL, and I see Catherine Hayhoe do her word cloud. And what are people mostly feeling? Hope and optimism were the two words that were coming up at the center of that exercise she did at the beginning of her talk. Um, I think when I have moments like one of the most devastating moments to me in terms of climate in the last year, uh, my family has a cottage on Lake Michigan and it's been in the family now for four generations. It's a little modest cottage. It's up on the bluff. And the Midwest has been having such heavy rains for the last several years that the, the lake level has risen, uh, risen so much. And while we were there this year on our family vacation, the water had come right, our, our fore dune is completely gone, and it had come right up to the dune, um, imagine kind of a little cliff of sand um, that, you know, had oak trees on it and everything. And while we were there, there was a storm, and the entire bluff, it calved. Like when you see, you know, in Antarctica, you know, huge glaciers or ice shield just calving trees just went, our, our house is still there, but it was kind of my worst climate nightmare. I literally have nightmares about losing, you know, losing it. And we were standing there watching and it just, oak trees went into the lake, you know, it was really traumatic. And at that moment, you kind of just want to give up. Uh, and I keep coming back to the subtitle of my book is to give a future with hope. And it's a verse from Jeremiah. And it's a verse describing when the Jewish people are in captivity in Babylon and obviously, you know, a dark phase. And God says, I just want you to keep, keep doing your work, keep planting, you know, keep planting, keep having children. 
um, you're supposed to work for the collective good of the city, you know, so you just keep doing it. And yeah, so it's, I don't know what else to do other than to have hope, um, you know, and to have that support and to have, you know, an organization like CCL, I just find that so, that's where I find my hope. You know, I'm going to uh, follow that with something that just came in the chat. It was uh, something to the effect of um, some Christians would say uh, the good Lord has uh, given us fossil fuels. Uh, how do we do anything else but use them? And the good Lord will take care of us, you know, um, which I find personally a disturbing response and twist of Christianity. But I'd like to know what you think as someone who, had, I mean, I'm a, I'm a biomedical scientist and I pray, but you actually spend time thinking about uh, in a systematic way what uh, God has been saying over the course of history and, and theology. What, what are your thoughts in reaction to that? Kristen? Is that a question for me? Okay. Um, I'm addressing it to you because of uh, where it came. Yeah, I almost want to pass that one over to David because I think that that very question um, that I'm, you know, I'm reading it there in the chat does come from that Western notion of, of you know, dominion, of dominance over the world. And which, like, as David was pointing out, I think is such a, a torquing, it's such a twisting of, of the biblical message. Um, I don't know, David, did you want to, did you have thoughts on that question too? I'm afraid my uh, immediate response is rather snarky. You know, the, 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 the good Lord gave us reproductive equipment. That doesn't mean any use that we can think of is appropriate. The Lord gave us fists. We might use it to bang something in that needs to be banged in and be careful not to break it, but uh, using it on another person, not so good. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's how, and everybody knows that how you use creation uh, makes a huge difference. Uh, I would say that, that, you know, once you get past the snark, then you have to uh, ask what's the person actually thinking. And what they're thinking is fossil fuels do a lot of good. And what they're not thinking is fossil fuels are now doing a lot of harm. Uh, and there I'd go to, you know, mine what uh, Catherine Hayhoe was saying about all the different ways in which climate change does matter to you because you're feeling the effects in this way, in this way, in this way, in this way, in this way. And then the person might come around and well, yeah, maybe that's not the best use of that resource right now. That's what I'd hope for anyway. Um, Can't talk my brother-in-law into it, but that's a different story. <laughs> David, let me... Uh push you just a little bit further. Um, I think part of that was a question about personal hope, not just how do you hope we might respond, but what's your hope for our ability to actually address climate change in time? I, when I was down for the papal pilgrimage, I was on the messaging team and I had half a million pilgrims and there were 5,000 volunteers who were there to support the pilgrimage. And I was giving a talk on uh, climate change to them to prepare them for any questions that came along about what Francis had to say. And afterwards, a couple of people grabbed me and said, you know, it doesn't sound like you think we're gonna make it. And I said, well, you know, it's true. Sometimes I don't think we're gonna make it. Our obligation is to try. Our obligation is to do our best not to fix things, but to do our best to try to fix things with the resources we have. Where are you at on this, David? Um, I, I think I'm pretty much in the same place you are. Uh, it, it, you know, from day to day, week to week, year to year, uh, I, I might often say, if I had to lay odds, I'd say the odds are we won't, looking at our history and, and, and how much we mess things up. Uh, on that score, I'm actually more hopeful right now than I've been in a long time because I'm just uh, really uh, delightfully stunned at how quickly the Biden administration is moving to make progress forward. 
it is a huge task. But at the same time, you know, all sorts of things that you thought think would never happen do happen. You know, the uh, the Soviet Union uh, came to an end. Uh, apartheid ended in South Africa. We do suddenly up and do things that people think are never going to happen. Uh, and we can do this. Uh, I think Michael Mann's most recent book, The New Climate War, is tremendously hopeful. The, and one of the things that he goes after is uh, inappropriate uh, skepticism, pe pessimism, and it's just too big, we can't do it. Uh, I, I really very encouraged by that down to earth book. Yeah, I'm hopeful. Okay, and Bill, you were pretty strong on uh, quoting from Pope Francis and Laudato Si. What's your answer to that question of hope? I'm, I'm um, always hopeful. Um, when I, I was in Austria, <clears throat> Vienna, uh, I arrived April 2nd, 1986, and 24 days later, the uh, reactor at Chernobyl exploded. I was 700 miles downwind, upwind, downwind from there, and uh, the plume passed right over Vienna. I had three young kids. It really um, impressed on me that we have to really do something for our children and our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. um, as, as, I, as I reflect on Chernobyl, I, I also saw the movie recently, My Life on the Planet with David Attenborough. I don't know if anyone has seen that, but um, he, it's, he starts the program walking through Chernobyl and talking about the disaster that happened there in 1986. And he comes back at the end and does an aerial view of Chernobyl and it's all grown over very beautiful green. There are deer running through there, foxes running through there. Life has been restored there. Um, so um, nature is wonderful in its, in, its cap in its capacity to restore itself. And I think, and I, 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 I'm hopeful because I can't look my children in the eye and tell them there's no hope. Because I, I think that there's tremendous opportunities for hope. Um, and I agree with you that we have to, we have to keep trying and trying and trying. There's no excuse to say that. There's no hope, let's give, give up. That's not, we make our own history. Mm -hmm. Our decisions make our own history. Amen. Yeah. Um, although I, I want to say um, there was a sci-fi movie, there have been a couple of sci-fi movies about Chernobyl and the fact that nature makes a comeback does not mean humanity can go back anytime soon. And certainly, yeah. certainly one thing that, that I, it's been impressed upon me is Earth is not in trouble. Earth will survive this. The question is whether Earth is going to be friendly to humanity if humanity continues to make a mess of the Earth. Because climate change is just Earth responding to what we've done and giving it right back to us. Right. We are sending it down that path. Yeah. Um, but Earth's going to do fine. Uh, do any of the panelists want to pose a question? A ask me. Is, uh, uh, is hey, Marion, go ahead. Marian, <laughs> Marian, oh, ask me. Go ahead. It's, it's three minutes past five, so we're officially at our, our closure time. Okay. I want to thank the panelists for pretty much keeping to your 10 minutes and, uh, and for packing a lot of good stuff in there. And we had a question of whether the, the, the view graphs will be shared. And we've been recording, right? So if so, yeah. later on, this can be found on where? On the CCL main Probably website? Probably the CCL main site will have a button that links to it. Okay. Um, and we encourage you to, to play it and watch it again. I think it'd be worth it. Uh, let me mention that I've put in the chat, if you scroll to the top, um, I've held over the last year a couple of uh, meditation sessions on climate change in the Lato Sea. And if you email me at that address, I'll send you information to hear more about it. Don't forget that this, this evening at 7, there is a movie uh, which we highly recommend. It's in the chat in addition to the uh, conference website. And then there are two sessions tomorrow. You can choose from at 1, um, either on the En-ROADS Climate Policy Simulator or on the Braver Angels uh, approach to talking about it. I wanna thank the speakers and I also want to thank all of you for joining us. 
uh, keep it in your prayers and keep on keeping on, as my pastor used to say, because uh, the task has been placed in our hands to do what we can, and it's not going to take care of itself. There's one new message. Um, yes, uh, in the chat, you'll find where the whole session will be posted on YouTube. So thank you, speakers. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And have a great rest of tonight and tomorrow. Enjoy the movie tonight. God bless. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody.